This show is a part of the FM Podcast Network, the home of great music podcasts. Visit us at fmpods.com. You are listening to the Dylan Ponce Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of What Is It About Bob Dylan? I'm your sometimes host, Erin Callahan, and I'm here live and in person with Henry Bernstein in Chicago. So to give you a little bit of background on who Henry is, he's quite impressive. Last year, a New York Times article opened with, Henry Bernstein has seen Bob Dylan 27 times in concert and owns three items autographed by him. A copy of the Freewheelin' Bob Dylan, a photograph of the singer, and a John Wesley Harding songbook. His favorite song is Tangled Up in Blue. Henry says this is a double crowning achievement in his life. When he's not obsessing over Bob Dylan, Henry works in operations and logistics for a local Jewish day school in Chicago. His other great loves, besides his family and Bob Dylan, are Superman, Star Trek, and the Chicago White Sox. In 2018, Henry, along with his friend Rabbi Brandon Bernstein, no relation, took their love of Judaism and comic books, and started a podcast called Funny, They Don't Look Jewish. Henry describes the podcast as a deep dive into explicit Jewish content within superhero comic books. This can be a character identifying as Jewish, practicing Judaism, speaking Hebrew, learning the Torah, and everything in between. Henry also co-hosts a podcast with Sam Brody called Superman and Lois and Pals, an episode-by-episode review of the popular CW TV show. Henry can be heard talking about Bob Dylan often on Pod Dylan. Henry credits his dear friend Rob Kelly with introducing him to the Bob Dylan Twitter community and giving him a platform to be a voice in the group. You should check him out. Henry lives on the north side of Chicago with his wife, a guitar-playing rock star rabbi, and his two young children all of whom enjoy Bob Dylan and tolerate Henry's obsession. Welcome, Henry. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy to be here in my own home, in uh, in front of my own uh, Bob Dylan uh, library. I'm really happy you're here, and it's really been really special seeing these shows with you, and thank you for having me. I'm honored. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for being here. So what is it about Bob Dylan? I, I think for me, and you know, I, I listened to a lot of the previous shows, and I, I hope they didn't inform my answer too much, but for me, it's, it's changed over time. When I was first getting into Dylan as a young 18, 19, 20-year-old, mm. it was the lyrics, and like seeing him, the young Bob Dylan, seeing him, his, his 18, 19, 20-year-old self in me, so whatever that is about young people getting into Bob Dylan at that period of time, and like searching for meaning as a young adult that that was th- that was that for me then then it was like when i got into my 20s and started playing guitar it was like more about the the craftsmanship of the musicianship like mm-hmm. what you know it's you know this is a really interesting chord progression or it's a not interesting chord progression progression but dylan makes it interesting because he's bob dylan um or finger picking you know mm-hmm. what he doesn't you no one to this day has figured out how he finger picked. Don't think twice; it's all right. He doesn't do it the same way that Paul Simon does it. He doesn't do it the same way anyone else would the finger picking pattern that anyone would do. He just did it his way. Um, so, and you know the way he solos, um, it, it's you know it's it's both very interesting, but also sort of a standard scale that he goes up and down. So, mm-hmm. while I'm becoming a musician, it was about that. And then as an older and then as I've gotten older as an adult and getting into my late 30s and now 40s, um, I'm, I'm interested in the person of, you know, who he is, what he's interested in, what he thinks about at this stage in life. Obviously, I'm, you know, I've got about, about 40 years to go to catch up to him. But, you know, he's, the, he's exactly the same age as my dad. My dad's birthday is exactly one month, June 24th, mm-hmm. 1941. So, like... You know, I see other people in that age um, demographic often, and I think about how they compare to Bob Dylan and their life and what they've seen in the world and why it is that he has this um, ability to put down in words what he sees in the world. So I think the the short answer is all of it. You know, the, the, the lyrics, the music, right. and the man. Right. And I think, too, like, 
so many of us come. I came to Dylan through the lyrics, as you said, but I was much younger. I was 12, 13 wow. years old. Wow. So my stepdad gave me a book of his lyrics. But I've heard is, you talk about yeah, that before. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> it is a point where we're, at, where we're trying to figure out who we are, how we're going to navigate the world as, as an adult, but he's also thankfully given us you know these ideas yeah. of a roadmap of like well here's a guy in his 40s and here's right. a guy and now in his 50s and here's a man in his 40s struggling to figure out how to create and to renew his create in the 80s to renew his creative energy and or becoming a dad and right. they're, they're identifiable life I guess milestones that are like every person goes through, like you're saying, and aging is ubiquitous. None of us are getting out of this alive. Right. Um, and so it's just like I think he—that's a gift he gives us—is like here's what I'm doing, and I'm you know he has sort of this universal language that. Right. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, like I even that when you said about being a father, like I, I look at those pictures of him from from Woodstock, the Elliot Lundy ones. Yeah, with yeah. the glasses yeah. and with his children. He he seems like a great dad in those pictures. And he seems like he really loves his children. Mm-hmm. And it, it, you know, I, I became a dad um, sort of later. I was about you know, 36, 37, 38. And we're, mm-hmm. we're older parents. So, you know, mm-hmm. um, and I look at him in those pictures and he's so young. You know, yeah. even then, yeah. you know, and he's already got like four kids. Like, right. you know, that period of time when he's up in the woods it seems like it's a short period of time like but but like he had like all these kids uh, just, it's poor Sarah she just kept popping them out but you know I'm watching him and I, and I think about like what what did he think about as a dad and you know and um and you know as I you know it's the greatest job I've ever had as being a dad and so to think about Bob Dylan in that stage of life and um, is, is interesting to like me. Bob Dylan in potty training. Like, yeah, right, right. Like Bob that. Dylan changing a diaper, you know. <laughs> right. Bob Dylan, you know, like... The mundane. Yeah, Bob Dylan um, <laughs> not getting, uh, you know, sleep training, you know, right. like... <laughs> right. Bob Dylan in negotiations with a toddler. Right, right. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And they just, you know, it, it's heartwarming. And I know that those pictures, the Elliot Lundy pictures, are they are contrived and they are planned. But they make me happy because he looks so healthy and I he know, looks I love happy. Yeah. And he and just, no, there aren't any dark circles right, under his right. eyes. He yeah. just looks at peace yeah. in that yeah. time. Yeah. And it's just, and maybe he's supposed to, and I'm yeah. falling for the bit, but yeah. I am. I, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what is your Bob Dylan origin story? Um, well, um, I, I'm a music fan. As a kid, I didn't really have a musical taste. I, my parents, although they lived through the 60s, they were already married and out of college and out of grad school and had jobs by 1968. So they got married uh, August 7th, 1968. So they, they just missed the, the baby boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad was born in 41, my mom 43. Uh, my aunt has a good taste in music. I <laughs> was a little younger than my mom. Um, but uh, th- so I've never really shared their musical taste. So I was a kid. We listened to show tunes. We listened right. to, you know, my mom was an aerobics teacher. So we listened to whatever 80s pop song she put into her, her set, you know, <laughs> you know, um, here and there. And so I, I kind of was on my own for music. Um and my brother, when he was in uh, middle school, liked Billy Joel. So, you know, I, I listened to Billy Joel. <laughs> you know, um, I have strong feelings about Billy Joel. Have you ever talked to Rob about that? <laughs> Virginia? No, Rob, Rob Kelly. No. <laughs> yeah, Rob Grayley, Heron, and I went oh. around and around at the Dylan and the Beats com- conference. I was like, no Billy Joel. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I got no beef with Billy Joel. He's okay. I don't listen to him regularly, but I, okay. I got no problem with him. Right. Um and yeah, I'd listen to the oldie station. So I was like, you know, aware of Satisfaction by the Stones and Hard Day's Night by the Beatles. And probably like the most classic classic rock thing I listened to was, was Beatles. Um, but then in high school, I, I had a friend who kind of gave me a tutorial in classic rock. He had a great CD collection. He would go to a uh, used music store and any, you know, every time he got money from his grandparents or a paycheck, he would go buy CDs. And we'd drive around in his car and he would... You know, we listened to Exile on Main Street. And he'd tell me all about, you know, the Stones and doing heroin. I was like 14. Like, I don't know what he was talking about. I don't know how he knew, but he, he had read rock books, you right. know. And we, Are you he, still friends with him? Um, we're friendly. He, yeah. His wife and I work together and his kids yeah. go to the school my kids go yeah. to where we work. Um, 
And, but we, he took me to two Stones concerts. He took mm-hmm. me to the Bridges to Babylon tour and the No Security tour. And those were like my first like classic rock concerts. And right. we had amazing seats. I'll never forget them. I mean, right. it was, I mean right. I'm so grateful to him for, uh, for, for, that, for that music education. Um, and greatest, Bob Dylan Greatest Hits Volume 1, which is just Bob Dylan Greatest Hits, <laughs> um, was in the rotation. So like I knew like a Rolling Stone and Blowing in the Wind and stuff like that. But I... It was just, he's just one of those guys. In the right. same way I was aware of Neil Young, but mm-hmm. not deep into the weeds, you know, like mm-hmm. I am now. Um, Grateful Dead and things like that. So then, uh, but then in college, the summer of uh, 2001, I was working at a summer camp in uh, Wisconsin with my brother, who's six years older than me, and um, my friend Josh. And they're both... Uh, yeah, shout out to my brother Arya and my friend Josh Freed. Um, they're both great. <laughs> they're both great music, you know, students of music. Um, my brother Arya actually is like a big um, hip hop fan, and he actually even put out a hip hop album about ten years ago, which is uh, very good. But anyway, um, my friend Josh was really into Bob Dylan, and he always he was kind of an old soul, old soul Josh. He would um, he was really into like old films and old music, mm-hmm. and really into Bob Dylan. And so as I was getting older, I kind of felt like I was ready to ha- be like part of an intellectual conversation about music and film. And um, with those people in particular, my brother, I've always looked up to mm-hmm. in many, many ways, but especially intellectually. And so I was just sort of ready. I was like open to be taught. And so my brother gave me a CD of Freewheeling, uh, Bring It All Back Home and... Blonde on Blonde. I think he didn't have Highway 61 or something. So, like, for whatever reason, those were the three CDs he gave me. And I think Visions of Johanna was really the, the one that opened up yeah. my eyes. I was just thinking that yeah. Rayleigh has this theory that, that, like, Bob Dylan loves the number three. And so the fact that you were given three CDs and that was, like, your st- starting off point is oh, kind of cool. I love that. Well, yeah. it's funny because, like, you can, yes, you can... You can, you know, triplicate right. many oh, of his albums. Yes, yes. Um, you know, you can wrongly triplicate Time Out of Mind with with, uh, with Love and Theft in Modern Times, but yeah, that's for another story. Right. But um, no, like, yeah. you know, with the folk albums and then, right. uh, of course, with the, the, the greatest trilogy of all time, um, you know, uh, bringing it all back home, Highway 61, right. Blah, Blah, Blah. Right. But for whatever reason, I listened to those three. And so the 60s stuff, it, there was never like a, I listened to the folk stuff, then I listened to the the um, the um rock stuff, then I, like, learning about Newport, I was like, what the fuck's a big deal? Like, right. it, it's, it's not a, it wasn't a thing for me. Like, it's all Bob Dylan to me. And at the same yeah. time, my friend Josh gave me time out of mind to listen to. And I think shortly thereafter, when I got back to school in the fall, I, I started listening to Blood on the Tracks. And so, like, it all got mixed up together, you know, mixed up the medicine, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what privileges younger Dylan fans, because mm. I think of, you know, in particular, what Paul Williams says, that we have to see him as many times as possible. Right. And now I feel a sense of urgency because we think, well, because of his age, and right. we think the touring's going to end. But... They, I'm always envious of them when they say, like, you know, I was at this concert. I know. <laughs> not alive. I know. Two-year-old, we couldn't go to I that know. concert. I know. But we have the advantage that it isn't a shock to our system to look at, you know, to think about him going electric because our consciousness has been most of his career was electric. Right. And so we have just this different way of, of interacting with his material that is almost more fun to me it's way more fun and it's more informative like you're just learning about periods of time like even the even the like uh the 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 jesus period so like the gospel period period, sorry so like (laughs) so like uh, so like obviously to me there are parts of that that are like painful and hurtful the idea that bob dylan probably the world's most famous jew besides jesus (laughs) but definitely one of the most famous american jews right um certainly from the midwest uh did that Mm -hmm. that's that's hurtful you know but it doesn't bother me like people get mad about it well they say to me all the time well didn't he you know denounce judaism no he had a period where he was a born-again christian and then left that and you know, there are many instances of his Judaism popping up since then, which we don't need to get into now. But, um, but, I but, would love but, to. but, 
Well, sure, I'm happy to. Yeah. You know, I, I know you you're, you're, when you you have that coming up, but That's like, true. but like the so the, again that trilogy. Right. To me, it's all just interesting to listen to, as a as a person who loves music and loves Bob Dylan. Like, mm-hmm. it doesn't offend me. Those songs don't offend me. The cover of Saved doesn't offend me in right. any way. I just think it's interesting, and there are amazing songs on that. Like mm-hmm. being able to be in in a in a room last night and here got to serve somebody and every grain of sand, you know, my, my second Dylan concert ever was in 2004 and he played, I believe in you. And I don't even think I knew that that was a, a Jesus song right. at the time when he wrote it. Right. It was, it sounded like a beautiful love song. I was like, this is great. I, right. I, that was how I learned that right. song. And I like went back and I was like, Oh, so, you know, you kind of take Dylan at, in however he's given to you. And I think also, like, he's struggling and trying to figure himself out. And he just kind of, you know, that was a thing that he thought might have the answers. And then he realized it didn't and yeah. he moved on. Right. But I do think it reminds me of what you say, like, the world's most famous Jew. Like, when um, Dave Chappelle inducted Jay-Z into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and he was like, he's ours. Uh-huh. He's speaking yeah. for us. Yeah. And I wonder like if, if Jewish folks feel that way about Bob Dylan. Like, I do. Can't, you can't have him. He's ours. I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Asked and answered. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I will say, you know, and I've talked about this with Rob before, like I am, you know, unapologetically and very proudly Jewish. It is a yep. major part of my life. I'm married to a rabbi. Both of my brothers are rabbis. I grew up uh, in a ritually observant household. I work at a Jewish day school. Um, my kids go to Jewish day school. Um, I loved my bar mitzvah. I loved, you know, right. I, I, I love learning Torah. You know, all, 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 the, all the stuff. I love you know, yes. practicing Judaism. And... I, yeah, it's like one of those ones where I like, I'm like, yeah, and, you know, Bob Dylan's Jewish too, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Just so you know, my friend Debbie Raps, whose uncle bar mitzvahed Bob Dylan. Um, she, really? Yes, yeah, she's one of my Dylan friends, and she gave me my Jewish name, Ruth. Aww. <laughs> so, just so you know. <laughs> um, that's sweet. But, yeah, but she that's that's one of her claims to fame. Plus, Aww. she shares a birthday with Bruce. That's cool. Not my, the same my, year, though. My, uh, my, my friend... Uh, Jeremy, who's a rabbi now in Deerfield, Illinois, here, mm-hmm. here in the suburbs of Chicago, he used to be the rabbi at Temple of Aaron in St. Paul, Minnesota, where B.D. Zimmerman was was a member for a while. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I just thought that was really cool. Oh, He's not cool. a Dylan fan, but he he likes I mean, like sending me Dylan stuff, you know. Isn't that like being from New Jersey and not liking Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not from Minnesota, I know. so it's no, okay. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I do want to ask you the question about the auto pen because that's no. how I, I mean, that's got to be the coolest thing ever. So look at a New York times article and your name is the first, the first two words are your name. So I will say as a proud subscriber and reader of the New York times who believes in the power of journalism and media or, you know, Lois Lane is my greatest hero as is Clark Kent. Um, you know, when I was Love a little that. kid, I wanted to be a journalist. I didn't know that like, it's not as glamorous as it is on Superman, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, um, you know, as a reader of the New York times, you know, uh, my wife and I, we submitted our, our love story to the, to uh, when we got engaged mm-hmm. to the New York times, um, wedding announcement section. And we, we thought it was a cool story. We were both from the South side of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a fifth generation South sider. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, she grew up, you know, she's, we were from the same neighborhood, but never knew each other. We thought we had a great story. They could care less in New York. So we didn't get, we didn't get picked. Whatever. We're like go right to the Tribune. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 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 So, um, so, you know, to get a call from the New York times was, I mean, just amazing. And then that my name is the first word in a New York Times article. It's it's just like I said, you know, in my in my bio, it's it's like two of the greatest things that could have ever happened in my life <laughs> about Bob Dylan. Even though it totally makes me seem like I'm a sucker for a scam of something totally stupid, like an like a autograph. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. But it's interesting because I think the question, like. Why did you want the autographed version? That's what. That's the, the always the thing that gets to me. It's like, I I don't know. I, I mean, I. But now I, you're. I mean, it, it led to great ends. Yeah. No, I know. Like the, the end story is like, well, I got my name in the New York Times. I right. Mean, I, 
I don't really have a great answer. As I said to Remy Tuman, uh, shout out, she did a great job with the article. Mm-hmm. It, it just, it felt, I felt like it was some sort of connection. I was picturing him sitting, right. even if it was a stack of 900 of them, right. I was picturing him on his tour bus signing them, signing so them. So like he had touched your book. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And I did already have three autographs by him, something else right. that a friend of mine who had a friend who was an autograph dealer got me as gifts that I didn't spend money on. So right. so, so first of all, I knew what his signature looked like. I could close my eyes and picture right, right now. I know that signature. But <laughs> um, I it just, I don't know, like the idea of a autographed copy of his book, it just seemed cool to me. And because... There was an option to buy now, pay later, <laughs> as every American loves <laughs> right. to do. Right. You know, it's like Klarna or one of those Did things. Did they give you free delivery? Because that's also a thing. Free delivery, <laughs> like it was. Yes. Yeah, but it was like you pay over time. It was like I was gonna. It was gonna like take me a year to pay it off. Right. You know, like twenty bucks a month, whatever right. it was. It was like sort of like an investment of like this cool piece of history to me. Yeah. And I know autographs are stupid. They're and, not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I I do have a. And generally, if I do get an autograph, it's part of the experience of meeting the person. Like, I go to Comic-Cons and, like, I like meeting the person, taking a picture with Mm -hmm. them, having them sign the thing. Yeah. And then framing it and putting it up in my room because I like experiences and remembering the experience. Right. So... The auto pen, so, so the the signature of something that I, of someone I I will never meet and have never met is there is a little dissonance, but I don't know. It was sort of um, it was sort of an impulse buy in a way. To be okay. <laughs> quite okay. honest with you, no, that's interesting because I. So let's put it this way: I didn't tell Lizzie, my wife, about it until the article came out, <laughs> and, and, and they had already refunded my money. <laughs> I think if you if it makes you happy, you know, God bless, go forward. It's just my, you know, David's dad asked me when I came. I was in New York this weekend last year, and I know someone who was who was uh, reviewing it. And so I got to sit with it and read it before anyone else could Mm. see it. And he said, I bet you want an autographed copy. And I said, no, that for me was badass. No one else can read it yet. I I got to read it. I got to sit there and read it. And I had the the words before anyone else did. Totally. Yeah. By the way, a year later, I checked on (laughs) you because I'm doing like a big purge right now of some collectibles and selling stuff on eBay. And uh, I, I was like curious. I was like, oh, I wonder how much. And now it's going, like as I predicted in that article on the second mar- market, yeah. it's going for like 200 bucks now because there's only 900 of them. It's yeah. a, it's well, kind of like became its own collectible. Yeah. So now I'm kind of thinking of selling it. I don't know. <laughs> Will it be worth more later? Though? I don't know. I don't think so. I yeah. think it's probably topped out at, <laughs> at, its, yeah. at its value. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> so to learn about you, I visited your website and I was um, intimidated to Aww. say that. Because <laughs> I was like, this guy, is, he's, he does everything. You are a renaissance man. Thank you. Oh, my. You are a scholar, an educator, a painter, a sculptor, musician, podcaster, advocate. And it goes on and on and on. And so many questions just on that stuff alone. But I have to limit myself. Sure. And so tell me more about your work. Uh, well, what kind of work? Like the, Any of it. Like the work, well, yeah. I, I, so I, I was a Jewish educator for many, many years. I was a mm-hmm. synagogue youth director. I worked with teens. Uh-huh. Taught middle school at a Jewish day school for a long time. Um, now I work in administration. I'm an operations and logistics person. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of getting burnt out from teaching right around the pandemic, like many teachers were. Right. Um, and also at the same time, coming out of the like having small babies stuff. So like the lack of sleep and the teaching, it just didn't mm-hmm. mix. It was like hard. And so, um, so that's what I do professionally. Um, and... Uh, I, I studied studio art in college. I've always I've been mm-hmm. drawing since I was three years old. I've been drawing pictures of Superman. My dream was to be a comic book illustrator. I really I wanted to work for DC mm-hmm. Comics and draw Superman for a living. That was my dream as a little boy. And I studied art. And I actually went to art school, um, mm-hmm. but first at Columbia College in Chicago, and then at um, Indiana University. And I majored in uh, art with uh, in studio art with a concentration in illustration. And I fell in love with painting and I also did pottery and stuff like that. And it became very clear to me in college that the, the, the comic book field, the art, the comic book art field is very hard to break into because it's not a growing field in that people can, people's skills don't diminish over time unless they like get arthritis and can't draw. Right. So if you started in 1965 as a comic book artist in the 90s, you'd still be working and, right. and on and on and on. Now, 
some of those older guys get replaced and there has been some stuff that you know about that that's unfortunate but anyway my point is is that my skills weren't what i would have what they should have been they could have been or should have been in order to be a comic book illustrator so i i was very happy just having it be a hobby and not a profession i didn't want to be a starving artist right. so i went into jewish education the most uh, the, the the a very lucrative uh field and teaching it's like niche within a niche but um um, Anyone in education, we're not in it for the money. One of, yeah, exactly. I mean, one of my uh, favorite things I ever painted was uh, the um, the cover. It's on my website. I don't know if you saw it. It was of Blonde on Blonde. And I it did. did a mixed media thing where mm-hmm. his hair yep. is sort of this hard material. Of course, that was the first <laughs> thing I looked at. I was like, that's um, so cool. Yeah. yeah. So that was I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. Um, I think, I think I have a drawing of like the hard rain. Yeah, because uh, I'm like, there. oh, art. Okay. I was like, yeah. damn, that's good. Oh, thanks. Like, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I, um, yeah. And so I still try to draw a little bit every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's even if it's just uh, pictures of Superman. I started uh, college as an art major because I wanted to do animation, but oh. I wanted to draw and paint cells. And it was trans- translating into computer animation. And I was like, I don't, I don't really want to do that. That's what happened to me. I couldn't get I, the graphic arts thing. Like, I, um, you know, I know Rob talks a lot about that on his mm-hmm. conversation on dilettantes about graphic art, graphic arts, and like right. I just couldn't get Illustrator and Photoshop and Quark and all those things. I, I took the classes, I learned how to do it, but to me, a pencil—you give me a pencil right. and a piece of paper, and I can be entertained. Yeah, like I made flip books with post-it pads when I was oh, a kid. Like, oh, I used to do that too. Stick uh, figures yeah. hitting home runs. Totally, you know? <laughs> totally. Yeah, mine yeah. was Superman taking off, but oh, yes, awesome. or the sh- or the shirt rip. Um, <laughs> But that's yeah, so and uh, and then as a um, as an adult, my creative um, sort of outlet kind of went into uh, playing guitar, and I started yeah. learning guitar in two thousand and four, summer two thousand four. I taught myself, and then I took lessons for um, about fifteen years with this one guy, mm-hmm. and uh, then he retired in January of twenty twenty. Uh, December thirty, December thirtieth or so, twenty of nineteen, and he told me go take an ensemble class at the Old Town School of Folk Music, and I did, and there I discovered um, mandolin, and oh, then the cool. pandemic hit, and we continued to do our classes on Zoom, and I just fell in love with the mandolin, and my wife um, continued to lead services for her congregation on Zoom, mm-hmm. and needed some accompaniment with her guitar playing. And now I'm a mandolin player. <laughs> so those are so like I kind of went from like studio art to music and then podcasting. So, so in my fantasy world, where Bob Dylan is listening to this, <laughs> if he needs a mandolin player, well, he's, he's got he's got Danny Heron, but I, was just saying, if, I if fantasize a, about that all the if time. If he has a falling out, <laughs> <laughs> I you, the the songs in which Danny is playing mandolin, I am laser focused on him. I it's yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> So all, a lot of any of those descriptors could be used to describe Bob. So how does Bob, does he inspire you in what you do? Or do you see a parallel? And you kind of did when you're like, well, he's at this point in his life and so am I. I, you know, it's funny. I don't think like th- that, I don't think that Bob Dylan as a person or even as a creator, like inspires me to be creative. Right. I just, you just are. I just like doing the things I like doing. So right. I love reading comic books. I love mm-hmm. drawing. Right. I love playing music. Mm-hmm. And I love playing mandolin specifically and harmonica right. and guitar. And I love singing. And I love learning how to harmonize. Um, and and so that's why I do those things. It I will say that sometimes it often comes back to Bob Dylan. Mm-hmm. Like anytime there's a new song or a new album i have to go to dillardcords.com and learn it even right. even if it's it's all good and just g over and over again <laughs> um uh, i once got in a fight with someone on the expecting rain forums about about that i was asking like hey has eof put up the chords yet for what album is that on together through life maybe and mm-hmm. uh, and someone was like oh yeah it's really hard mate to figure out the chords to it's all good i'm like I, I know. I, I know it's in one chord. I'm just I'm trying to I'm just asking a question. <laughs> okay. I just asked for an answer in yeah. editorial. Yeah, and someone's like and someone attacked me for asking a rudimentary question about chords. But anyway, so I, you know, there's always a connection there, but I don't right. think I would I don't think Bob Dylan inspires me yeah. creatively. I'm just fascinated by him and I love him. He is his own like category of things I'm interested in. Right, like right. I, I would count my interest in Bob Dylan as part of my creative outlets. Like like I was saying, like when Rob asked me to be on Pod Dylan, right. um 
either I think right before the pandemic, after the 2019 tour, when I saw him twice, Mm -hmm. um, that was the first time I got to talk about him publicly and not just to my friends who don't care (laughs) or my friends who do care, but we've had the same conversations over and over again. So that is like a creative outlet for me too, is talking about pop Or your spouse is like, please stop. (laughs) (laughs) She, she's, she is great. And I'm saying that for like most people who are obsessed with Bob and their spouses are probably like, please stop. She, you know, I, I limit what I tell her. So like, I, you know, I called her after the show to tell her about born in Chicago and 40 days and 40 nights. I called her last night and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, right when your call went to voicemail. Um, <laughs> just kidding. And so she's, she's great. She, yeah. she, she tolerates, not only tolerates it, she seems to be interested when yes. I express how interested yes. I am. <laughs> That's very cool. So the podcast, Funny They Don't Look Jewish, focuses on Jewish content in comic books. And mm-hmm. that's really cool. I, as I said, I have a book of Jewish athletes. Oh, oh yeah. The, oh, that, that really thin one. Yeah, it is a very thin <laughs> one. Chapter one, Sandy Koufax. Chapter two, that's it. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> that's every bar but mitzvah you, boy has gotten that very thin but you pamphlet. Know, but you know, I'm like, Julian Edelman is he? I'm like, but he doesn't yeah. identify as Jewish. But no, he does. Now he's wearing Star of David. He does, Because yeah. when I was reading about it, he didn't. Yeah, and he I was does. Like, yeah. He does. My friend, uh, who I mentioned, my friend, Rabbi and Jeremy Fine. this is Fine. why I'm called Ruth. Yeah, okay, there you <laughs> yeah. go. My, my friend, Jeremy Fine, uh, who's a rabbi, he, uh, he has a sports blog um mm. so we're about similar things but for right. sports athletes called the great rabino yeah and um and he's he's interviewed he's talked about juliana a lot he loves that's it cool. yeah that's he's, cool he's, yeah so tell me about that podcast sure um it is uh as, as you said in the intro quoting me um yes it, it focuses on explicitly jewish content so what mm-hmm. that means is not necessarily some random character saying oy vey or something right. like that right. or a uh showing the lower east side in new york in 1920 and showing you know in the background a uh, uh, black hat jew walking by in the background right. not that that could be included right. but specifically the character the thing ben grimm right. um in 2002 canonically uh was uh, had a bar mitzvah and uh, a Jewish wedding a few years ago. Um, the character uh, Kitty Pride in 1980 wore a Star of David and famously talked about celebrating Hanukkah when the rest of the X Men were celebrating Christmas. And mm-hmm. uh, Batwoman Kate Kane is Bruce Wayne's first cousin and she's Jewish and she studies uh, Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism. Mm-hmm. There's stuff like that in comics. There's not that we have found that. It is very limited what's in there, and mm-hmm. so we're, we're we're like focusing on characters who identify as Jewish, but also uh, we've now got into like some side characters. So who knew that in 1980s Captain America had a Jewish girlfriend named Bernie Rosenthal? You know things like that. Yeah. Um, and so we've interviewed a couple um, comic book writers like Jerry Ordway, who's not Jewish, but he wrote. Um, uh, he, he created a character who was famously Jewish and uh, Paul Kupperberg, who's uh, who wrote had a run of Supergirl where she lived in the north side on the north side of Chicago and whose landlady awesome. was uh, Ida Berkowitz and mm-hmm. there and fought a villain who was a Holocaust uh, uh, first a survivor, but then sort of a Holocaust denier. Mm-hmm. It was like so there's that kind of stuff right. in com- in superhero comic books. And our whole goal our that whole, was my next question, so thank you. What was our point, right? Yeah, yeah. The whole point is that inclusion in comics matters. And mm-hmm. so representation. while it's representation, that it, we keep every episode we keep coming back to that. And right. so while it's really important for little girls to see Kamala Khan on the big screen as Ms. Marvel right. alongside Brie, blonde Brie, Brie Larson right. as Captain Marvel, I think it's equally important for kids to know that the thing from the Fantastic Four is Jewish and has worn a kippah in a comic and worn a talit and has prayed and, uh, and you know and has lit Hanukkah candles and um, and so we want all the inclusion, but we also want uh, you know we explicitly want <laughs> Jewish but inclusion. But we don't. We don't. I think that that's it's it's an important forum because we don't talk about 
Jewish representation as widely as we talk about representation right. in in other ways, and especially uh, with the that's true. <laughs> it, no, I agree with yeah, you. I'm yeah. like I'm I'm championing yeah. your cause, Thank and you. now I will yeah, shout I mean, it from the rooftop. People talk when people talk about comic books and Judaism, they always go to Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who created mm-hmm. Superman in 1938. Right. Clearly, a story the a moses story um a story of a refugee a story of a survivor a story of someone who championed the oppressed um who fought for social justice um but they talk about the creators they don't talk about the actual characters and so you know in my mind superman is sort of jewish but he also clark kent grew up in kansas probably protestant or uh you know uh right? in smallville kansas i don't know right. this this the how big the smallville kansas jewish community was but um so we're, we're trying to find those areas or right. we're sort of we keep thinking we're reaching the end uh we're circling around a big character named magneto who is famously a holocaust survivor yes. um and we haven't gotten to him yet because we keep finding these other little characters yeah. but uh it, it there seems to be a finite list of Jewish characters. It's not so. I don't know if we'll, we'll near the end. We'll reach the end of it, but um, we're working on it. So once you talk about Magneto, and you, if you reach the end, will you go on to musicians? Because that was my question. Like, um, where, when do we talk about music? Like, yeah, I, I, that I think has been done. Yeah. more and maybe not to the extent. I mean. The, the Dylan Jewish thing has been done. A lot of people ask me all the time, well, what about, and you, right. maybe you're going to ask me, no, about, you know, Bob I'm... Dylan and Judaism. It's been done a lot, and there are better people like Seth Rogovoy and Harold Lapidus who are m- more experts on it. I can't tell you how many people send me some vapid article from theforward.com about... Bob Dylan's 20 most Jewish songs. I'm like, I know, I've read this a hundred times. You know, right, and, right. and you know, it seems to come out every every Passover or something. And I don't know that I don't know that his songs are explicitly Jew. Or certainly, you know, other than Talkin' Hava Nagila Blues right. and Forever Young, which is clearly yeah. based on the priestly blessing. I, I don't know that his songs are explicitly Jewish, but. Um, I I think better people can do that. The no, musician one. I, 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 <laughs> I do I do love Seth's work. So that was one of my questions for you. But more than just train spotting, but people actually digging into the work and finding like those intertextual references to show how they have meaning and mm-hmm. that you know that the Jewish values that he grew up with yeah. that they're they're you know or even the ideas that that they are in his texts. I, yeah, and I think it's there. I mean, I think, yeah. and I think other other people have done it. And I yeah. think that, like, like I, you know, it's it's clear he had a Jewish upbringing. Right. He had a bar mitzvah. Everyone has seen. Everyone of us have right. seen the, the the bar mitzvah program with that mm-hmm. cute little those cute little cheeks, and is you know, and um, and you know, I know of many anecdotal stories. If you know someone from from the Twin Cities, you know someone who's at least two or three degrees from. Bob Dylan, who's mm-hmm. related to Bob Dylan. Right. I know at least, I've, I've heard from at least two or three people at camp, where I went to camp, Jewish summer camp, who was like, oh yeah, Bob Dylan was at my, my Passover Seder. I was like, what? And they didn't really have any more information, but right. like, or, or was that my aunt's Passover Seder? So right. like, like, there's a famous story from, um, I think it was 2003, maybe mm-hmm. it was a little later, but where he had a concert um either the the night the night that Yom Kippur was ending so like at, at, and mm-hmm. he was in Atlanta that night and there's a famous story of him showing up at synagogue that morning mm-hmm. and um, taking what's called an aliyah which is a ble- you, you're called up by your Hebrew name to bless the Torah before it's read mm-hmm. and he even said a blessing uh, what's called a Misha Berach which is like sort of a catch-all blessing for either someone who's ill or someone that you want to just honor mm-hmm. um, for his children and like at, at the local Chabad which is uh, the Lubavitch um, sect of, of Judaism that they have like sort of centers all over he mm-hmm. famously of course was on the Chabad telethon twice <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> which right. I talked about with Rob right. Kelly right. Um, and uh, so you know, there are anecdotal stories about his Judaism now, which I, why I, I, you know, I sort of push back when people are like, well, did he convert to Christianity? It's like, 
you know, so, you know, we sort of, you know, he seems to have reclaimed his Judaism. I don't know how much it is a part of right. his life, right. but it seems like it is, has been present there in the last 20 years. And I know people like to throw back at me that quote where he says, where he said recently, I read all scripture, mm-hmm. you know, the, the apostles and the Bible and da da I'm sure that's true. There's a yeah. lot of good material in there for songs. Right. I don't think that means that he believes Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior. Savior. I don't know that he believes in God as a man up in the sky. He might believe as music or as God or as the universe, as mm-hmm. God, as nature, as the you know something else, as the spirit. You right. know, the, whatever moves him to write a song might be God. It doesn't matter to me. Right. Um, I, I I I just appreciate that he's Jewish. <laughs> I like yes. it. Yes. I'll take him. But so any to answer your question, someone else could do that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate. I, someone else could bring me on to their podcast to talk about it. There you go. <laughs> I love that though. When someone asks me a question, I'm like, I, like I think better people could do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll stick to comic books. Yeah. That's, that's my thing. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, um, as an educator, you've answered all these questions that were in between. Mm-hmm. Um, so, as an educator, have you ever used Dylan anything Dylan related in your classroom? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and when I was a synagogue youth director and I taught Hebrew school for the high schoolers, I did a whole um, like mini. Uh, unit on bob dylan and we we did like the jewish stuff the christian stuff the the i sort of went through like broadly his whole Mm -hmm. uh by this point uh no direction home had already come out so there's a lot of material to pull from thank you um but yeah i've taught i've used him and i've used dylan lyrics in things we've studied um uh hard rains are gonna fall Mm -hmm. and um um, yeah, I, definitely. I, I used to use the Beatles. So was it successful when you you used it? I think my students um, tolerated it and humored I, me yes. because they know that, you know, their, they see how excited their you favorite are. Yes. Mora Henry, which means teacher Henry yes. in Hebrew, was excited to share with them something. And yes. maybe, and, and I just hope that when they're in college, mm-hmm. they'll get into Bob Dylan. You yeah. know, my, my nephews who are now uh, in college, like, then they're musicians like yeah. they're into Bob Dylan now, yeah. right around the same time I got. I, I think it's just, I think you just, you know, you. I think you're a you're an outlier that as a young as a twelve year old you. I think you're lucky that you got into it. I young, know. Thank but, you to my boomer stuff. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Oh, now you're gonna get attacked for for saying the word boomer. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know. But no, I I used to use the Beatles for. Um, point of view because it was very conscious that she wrote that they wrote was it they don't want to hold your hand she loves you and uh-huh. they wrote love me do because they want to write from the second person perspective right right and so i used to use that but then i'll use dylan in different ways and right now my poor lit and film class is being subject to dylan quite a bit oh <laughs> and they are they're doing they're they are very willing participants they're they're tolerant they yeah. are they yeah. are tolerant all right so what are you currently working on um, I am currently working. You mean like creatively? Anything, yeah, creatively. I just I this this folk music class that I take. It's called mm-hmm. Celebrating Tradition, uh, the Monday Night Special, and it's basically like our two teachers bring us an awesome folk song that we've done Dylan songs uh-huh. before, um, or and folk songs could really mean anything, right, like anything right. they're into, uh, anything that. And the idea is that the group learns the song together first without a lyric or chord sheet just mm-hmm. learning the chords together and the idea is that everyone can play it everyone can learn a simple solo a simple melody and mm-hmm. everyone can sing a verse um and so i'm like really focused on that um and uh and then singing with um my wife's synagogue uh singing group called the davening team davening is yiddish for praying um and uh, like we just had a very joyous Yom Kippur where I got to play mandolin and um, mm-hmm. sing. And that's that's sort of what I'm working on mm-hmm. creatively now and, and my podcasts. Yeah. yeah, that's wonderful. It sounds very communal, very, very in the spirit of folk music that everybody learns together at the same pace. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's, that's the idea. It's, it's so cool. So what other music do you listen to and how does it relate to Dylan? You know, uh, I, I, my my other my co-host on my other podcast, uh, 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 Professor Sam Brody, he 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 says I, I'm very I, I like boomer rock. So yeah, uh, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, again, yeah, there we go yeah, with the turn. Good. Yeah, uh, yeah, Grateful Dead, yeah, um, uh, Stones, mm-hmm. Neil Young, Leonard Cohen. Um, 
Uh, but I have, there are some other modern things. My, my other great love is uh, an amazing artist named Grace Potter from Vermont. I've mm-hmm. seen her 25 times. Uh, she was actually in Chicago the same night as Dylan. I had tickets for it, but had to go to, had to go to Dylan Tough instead. Choices. Tough choices. I, I was, it's my nightmare that I've always feared, but it came true. Right. Um, uh, like I said, the Beastie Boys early, but I honestly, I haven't listened to them as much since MCA died because it just, it makes me sad right. when I listen to them. Yeah. Same thing with Leonard Cohen. I haven't yeah. listened to him much. Um, um, but fish, I'm a big fish fan, mm-hmm. like jam band. I had a jam band period. Uh, but I would say like the top ones are like Dylan, Dead, Beatles, Stones, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, great spotter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I'm listening to music and it's not my children's music or their podcasts in the car, not kids I'm, pop. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm listening to to Dylan okay. uh, music. I'm, and and when I listen to Bob Dylan, I want to make this very clear. I'm listening to a live show that. Uh, that you know, I found that found their way into my hands. That someone has graciously <laughs> right. bootlegged okay. for us exactly. to enjoy. Exactly. Yeah. Or or I'm listening to like Telltale Signs or Fragments. Like mm-hmm. I am usually listening to Dylan post 1997. Okay. That's that's like what I'm mostly focused on I and love interested Telltale in. Telltale Signs. It's my favorite. That's my favorite bootleg series. It's, Even including Fragments, it's my mm-hmm. favorite bootleg it's so series. Good. That. Th- that my immediate comfort Dylan mm-hmm. song mm-hmm. is 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 is, is the, the opening riffs of that of that um, of that Mississippi the da 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 yeah. da 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 yeah, I love when he goes, all right, let's try it in A flat. And yeah. they just, the band just does it. Yeah. Um, also, Good As I've Been To You is my yeah. other, like, mm-hmm. like, I could just fall asleep to that. Like, yeah. if I, when I'm on an airplane and I'm, like, about to have a panic attack, I, have, I listen to Good As I've Been To You. I feel like <laughs> this is crazy because we're having this conversation and we literally just met days ago. <laughs> and from the time that you we messaged each other... I don't know, a year or so ago, you have been just the kindest person and I just feel like you're a kindred spirit. You're like, I love this. And I'm like, me too. Uh. You know, maybe it's just because we agree on things, but we have the yeah. same aesthetics, but I, I I, feel like you're a kindred spirit. I love that. Thanks. All right, so what is your favorite Bob Dylan memory? Uh, the, the, the first show is up there, okay. but in 2009 or 2010, I've seen a lot of Halloween shows because he seems to always be in Chicago this time of year. This is actually early for him. Usually mm-hmm. he's like, it's a Halloween. It's usually Have you does... seen that weird thing on the, on the stage? It looks like a jack-o'-lantern. No, I didn't look catch it, that. Look okay. I'll look for okay. it tonight. Um, my favorite Bob Dylan memory was in, in uh, it was either, it was either October 30th, 31st, 2009 or 2010. I can't remember mm-hmm. which one because I went to both there in Chicago. Uh, he, he, it was the only, first time, uh, it was the only time until last night where he did something unexpected and weird. Mm-hmm. He said, all of a sudden, in the middle of the show, ladies and gentlemen, Tom Waits. And the crowd went insane. <laughs> and then Stu Kimball just walked up to the mic and <laughs> played uh, two verses of Jesus Gonna Be Here. <laughs> And then walked back to his spot. And then they continued the show. And that's probably, and it was just like, it was all, almost better that it wasn't Tom Waits coming on because it was such a funny, weird, like, you know, it's sort of like uh, Fish does a, a, a Halloween thing. They do a costume. They'll play either a whole album or a whole or a new album or something. Right. And it was sort of like that. Like Bob Dylan put on a costume for a minute on Halloween. So. And he has that. And, and you know. You read so much about Bob Dylan, you know things, but then having worked on the book, one of the contributors, our set list book, one of the contributors wrote about his Halloween show in 63 where he says, I have my Bob Dylan mask on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like he... Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. I love that kind of stuff. I mean, oh, one time because in two, like he's funny, right? He's funny. And in two thousand five, actually, he had not been playing like Rolling Stone for a couple of years, mm-hmm. and then and he did like a four night run in Chicago, maybe five nights at the Auditorium Theater, and for whatever reason, on like night two, it was April second, he played like Rolling Stone and. To borrow a fish term, it was a bust out because like no one had heard it in a long time, mm-hmm. and like the crowd went nuts, and like right. that was fun. It was like for whatever reason, on that in that moment, he wanted to play like Rolling Stone, a song right. that he's played thousands of times, mm-hmm. and the crowd loved it. And right. I just that was a, a happy mem- that was like a great memory too, cool. Bob Dylan. Oh. What's your weirdest Bob Dylan concert that you've been to? Um, uh, the weirdest That's one. Like, I'll, I'll tell you mine while you think. Yeah, he played at the Houston Livestock and Rodeo Show, and there were people who like who were trying to like dance. Uh, like they were dressed like they're going to a club, 
because you just go to the rodeo and then stay for the concert. We just went to the concert. Uh-huh. So we knew what we were in for. But uh-huh. there was like, I mean, he opened with I Am The Man, Thomas. And oh, it was nice. Like a gra- it was oh, a great late set. 90s. Yeah. yeah no, early it, 2000s. It, it, early 2001. 2000s. Yeah, yeah. 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 A 102, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he, it, it was just, and that's always a concert I forget because it was so short. But watching the people try to respond to Dylan yeah. was just really fascinating. Weirdest. Uh, oh, I'll tell you exactly what. It's it's not, it's weird in a, in a bad way also. Like there's a lot of weird Dylan right. shows in a good way. Right. You know, the, the weirdness of him is what we, one of the things we love. Right. Um, at the, uh, my first show since having our first child is now six. Uh, um uh, we're still in the throes of it. It was like November of 2017, you know, still mm-hmm. not sleeping through the night, but like Bob Dylan came to town. It was when he was doing like those um, small arenas, which aren't as good as the theater shows. So it was, was the, it the, oh, okay. So like, yeah, not yeah. when he was doing the ho- no, hockey no, no, arenas no, no, in 2006. No, no. This is like 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the Wind Trust Arena in Chicago, downtown Chicago, it just, it just opened up. Um, the crowd sucked. Mm-hmm. It was, a bunch of people in their 60s and who were talking throughout the whole thing. <gasps> Matt, he was trying some weird things. Oh, it was the Mavis Staple Tour. Okay. So Mavis yeah, yeah, opened. Yeah, she yeah. was amazing. Yeah. He was doing, he did a weird arrangement of Tangled Up in Blue that didn't quite work, but like I appreciated it because it's my favorite song and now I got to hear a new arrangement. Right. And and these guys were talking the whole time, like, oh, I don't know, what song's this? I don't, you know, like the whole thing that like they're going to hear the, the you know, he was playing like early right. Roman kings, like things that were in his current catalog, right. and and they were mad about it. I was just like, fuck you guys, you know. Yeah. Uh, the other weird one was um, that run in 2015 at the Cadillac Palace Theater. Mm-hmm. My wife on our third date, we we went to see him the third <laughs> night, but on this. <laughs> On this first night, she encouraged me just to go down, or the second night, just to go down there. I didn't have tickets. She's like, mm-hmm. maybe you'll get a ticket. Yeah. Um, I, there's no one selling any tickets outside the theater. I stood outside, listened to the first set. He was taking a set break, break, yeah. break on that tour. During the second set, or at the set break, a bunch of people came out to smoke. And then this some young person came out. I mean, I was younger, too, at the yeah. time. But he was like a 20-something-year-old with his girlfriend. He was like... He's like, oh, that sucks. You know, like, I couldn't understand a word he was saying, whatever. And he's like, do you want my ticket? I was like, yeah. It was in the third row in the center. (laughs) This asshole just left in the middle of the show. So I got to see the second half of the show. So that was another weird one. But that was a weird good one. That is weird good. Uh, Yeah. All right. So I have two questions that I usually close with. And then I say anything else you want to say. One is if you could ask him anything, what would it be? (sighs) I think about this all the time. And on the one hand... Um, I think about like I, I like try to list like weird songs that I know about and want to ask him about like because now I know so many folk songs that right. like from like 1901 you know and the, eight, the 1890s to all the way to the modern stuff and like I want to ask him about I have like a list of folk songs that I want to ask him about yeah. to see if he knows them and what he thinks about them that's cool um, so like that's sort of like been good about my folk class that mm-hmm. like to, to have that in my right. back pocket like have you ever heard of yeah. Caleb Clotter and you know or like something random you know yeah. and he's because I know the answer will be yes and then he'll have an opinion on it yes. um, and I also like I would love to ask him about Judaism like yeah. what his current relationship is with Judaism mm-hmm. and maybe he he's probably tired of that question yeah. so like that's kind of one of those ones that maybe not but maybe I could get I could like maybe if it's in a scenario where that's like an appropriate thing to ask him I would love to ask him about that that's about cool. Judaism what about, um, so the other one, and it's kind of macabre. Yeah. Um, so what's the last song you want to hear in your life? The last Dylan song as you're going off into... Yeah, Tangled Up in Blue. It's okay. my favorite song of all time. And mm-hmm. it's my one, you know, if I if I was stuck on a, you know, deserted island, it's the one song I, I could, I, I never get tired of it. And we're talking original version, you know, right. from Blood on the Tracks. I, what is it about the song? I love it also. <sighs> I mean, it is clearly one of his greatest songs of all time. I think we could say objectively, objectively. that it, it's one of his greatest hits. It's one of his best songs I'm of all sure time. I'm sure someone will argue with us, but that's fine. They can I, be I can't wrong. imagine a Dylan fan not having it in their top 20 or even their top 10. Okay. But anyway, um, it's it has it has it it has it's easy to play on guitar, but it's mm-hmm. interesting enough. Like there's enough chord changes that it's not just. GCD over and over again. Right. It has harmonica in it. It has 
lyrical very variations that are endless so mm-hmm. if you are playing it by yourself you can have fun with it right and if you're listening to it you can remember oh wait on real life he does it that way or you know mm-hmm. the, uh, that year he did it that way um and who the fuck knows what it's about right. like is it the way that weaves in and out of first and third person right is is it a movie that we're watching or is it a biographical right. thing and so and the lyrics are so interesting and it's just beautiful and it moves along. It just, yeah. it moves and you can keep going. And by the time it ends, you're not like, oh, I wish it wasn't over. But you're also, it, it's like a perfect length. It's not too long, not too short. Yeah. Um, and it's got a great harmonica solo. Yeah, I remember, I think it was at Dylan of the Beats, Grayley asked me, like, who's the person, like, who, who what, what's he doing with the slaves? What's he what? What's he doing with the slate? Oh, yeah, I, I know. I was I know. Like, like, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But again, who is that person? Is that right. Bob Dylan? Is that right. the person he's talking about? Is yeah. that this woman? Is and it we're like... We're trying to like puzzle it out. And it's just, yeah, yeah, that one I don't think too much about. So. Yeah. Right, that's fair. So yeah. I, I do love that. Yeah. It is, it's such a good song. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else you want to say about Bob Dylan or say for the good of the order? I think I've said it all. <laughs> As Howard Stern likes to say, you've said it all. You've said it all, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I love him so much. I really, I'm so grateful to you for I'm giving me a chance to, to, like, have a place to talk about him. I'm grateful to Rob for giving me a place to talk to him. Anyone who is willing, who cares about what I have to say, some kid from Chicago who just likes him, I, I just, I love him so much. And I love, I, I can't tell you the most special thing about this weekend has been these gatherings, meeting you, meeting Roberta. I've been, you know, I've been in touch with Roberta now for three years. You know, like mm-hmm. all these people on Twitter, you know, I've, I've seen their head and, <laughs> and and just to meet them yeah. and hug them. And I, I can't believe it. It's, yeah. And it's like, I've met a family, like a, um, I don't want to sound trite, but like, you know, saying goodbye last night, you know, to Matt and Jenny Steichen, like right. I was sad about that. Right. You know, and saying goodbye to Annie Burkhardt on the first night, I know. that was sad. Right. Like I, but to be able to share that with them and these people, there. Oh, there are other people like me. For so right. long, it's like me and my friend Josh, who lives in New York, and we don't talk that often, except for when like a Dylan album comes out. Right, and that's it. And you know, now I have this whole group of people. Who would have thought? Do you know the the video? Maybe this is where we'll close because this is how I say it. The video for No Rain. Yeah. Where the little girl the bee. finally finds her bumblebee people. Yeah, yeah. These are your bumblebee yeah, people. totally. That's what I say. I'm like, these are my bumblebee people. Totally. We also call it Bob Dylan Sleepaway Camp. Because uh, <laughs> everybody is so happy it, to it, be here. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank I've you. had a blast talking with you and Me meeting too. you. And we're face to face. This is Yay, so great. This is so cool. All right. I'm going to stop recording now. David loves that I put that on every single one. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>